Good morning and welcome to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. Now, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez and I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And I am so thankful that you're joining us in worship this morning. I just want to remind you to head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, after worship this morning uh, to find out everything going on here at St. Andrew, especially as we begin the season of Lent in just a few days. Uh, we'll have an entire midweek series uh, that actually connects to our Sundays as well. And so we'll have midweek services all online this year. And so you'll be able to worship with us uh, throughout the season of Lent as we return to the Lord. Our theme this year is return and receive. And you'll hear more about that beginning this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, February 17th. Uh, I pray that you have a wonderful and blessed worship uh, this morning and this week as we prepare ourselves uh, to enter into the season of Lent. But this morning, we rejoice for the Lord has been transfigured and so we are celebrating and giving thanks for all that he has done for us. With that being said, I pray a blessing on your worship this morning. And as we begin, we do so in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Scripture, God tells us that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us then confess our sins before God as we seek His mercy, His forgiveness, and His grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are sinners, sinful from birth. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. We have not loved you with all of our heart and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as much as we have loved ourselves. Forgive our sins and the hurt we have caused by what we have done and left undone. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In his great love for you, God sent his son into the world to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. I therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our reading this morning for Transfiguration Sunday comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did, know, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Lights, please. Oh, hey everyone. Isn't it amazing how much of a difference light can make? Without it, you couldn't really see me, but now you can. This is what happened during the Transfiguration. Jesus brought Peter, James, and John up a high mountain. Suddenly, a beautiful light was shining so bright around Jesus, and his disciples saw him in a new way. The light of Jesus shines on him so that it can shine through you. His light shines through you when you are kind to others. His light shines through you when you help those who are in need. And his light shines through you when you tell your friends about him. When the light of Jesus shines through you, people can see his love. Let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for your love and for being our light. Let your light shine through us so that people can see you. We love you so much. In your name we pray, amen. On October 25, 1971, a magical place known as Walt Disney World was dedicated on 27,000 acres of land in central Florida near Orlando. Unfortunately, Walt Disney himself wasn't present on that day because he had passed away about five years earlier, leaving his brother, Roy Disney, to lead the completion of what was known back then as Project X. Anyway, the story goes that after the ceremonies, Roy Disney and a colleague were standing on Main Street, USA, looking up toward the Cinderella Castle in the middle of the Magic Kingdom, when the colleague commented to Roy with a note of sadness that it's just too bad that Walt isn't here to see all of this. Roy Disney shook his head and said to his friend, on the contrary, Walt saw this before anybody else which is to say that Walt Disney had a vision and that vision was so compelling to him and then to those who came after him that through a season of challenges and difficulties and obstacles and a lot, a lot of money, it finally became reality. It became the magic kingdom. Well, some of you longtime members of St. Andrew might recall, I told that story back in the early 2000s on more than one occasion when our congregation was located at a smaller site about five miles from where I'm standing right now. And after a period of prayer and discussion about how we might reach more people with the gospel of Jesus, with the ministry of Christ, we began to envision a new place, a new church home albeit on 13 acres and not 27,000. And while some people wanted to understandably stay where we were, the vision did catch on through renderings of what it might look like, floor plans for us to look at, and a prayer path that was created on this 13-acre field of dreams in the ex exact shape and size of the church building that was ultimately built and dedicated to the glory of God who saw it before anybody else and gave us that vision so that through a season of challenges and some obstacles and difficult moments and millions of freely given dollars, it became reality. Not just a place, but 
for the sake of an experience, not in a magic kingdom, but in the gracious and glorious kingdom of God. And today I share those two somewhat different stories as we come to our annual celebration of the transfiguration of our Lord, bringing us to the end of the season of Epiphany, on the other side of which is Ash Wednesday and the 40 days of Lent. In fact, it might interest you to know that our congregation made its decision to make that move on a Transfiguration Sunday. And then we actually signed the settlement papers that formalized all of it on another Transfiguration Sunday a few years later. And so this day has history for us. It calls us back to some of our own mountaintop experiences. And yet none of them compare to the mountaintop experience of Peter, James, and John, who were led to that high place by Jesus where he was transfigured, where he shined with the dazzling light of heaven in a way that enabled them to see him like they had never seen him before, shining with the light of God, revealing Christ to them in a very powerful and a very transforming way. They also had a vision of Moses and of Elijah, who were impressive company because they represented the law and the prophets of old. And as you heard from the Gospel of Mark and in the other Gospels, Peter wanted to stay there, understandably, and he even offered to build these dwelling places for Jesus and for Moses and for Elijah, which may sound a little strange or odd to you, but in fact that is what pious Jews would do annually when they celebrated a holiday known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Peter wanted to respond to the vision, by doing something, by building something beautiful, because he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. But God had a different vision for Peter and James and John and for the others who weren't on the mountaintop that day as he called them to go back down into the plain with him, not realizing that what they had experienced that day was a preview of Easter Sunday. Kind of like a fireworks display that you might go and see where at the beginning it looks so impressive to you, but then it leads you to the grand finale, which in this case is the resurrection of the crucified Christ and the power of a light that shines through the darkness of every person's life. And so even though they understandably wanted to stay on that mountaintop that day, that vision given by God in the person of Christ gave them the power to go on back down into the valley where there were great challenges and difficult moments and obstacles to overcome and difficulties to endure. As they followed Jesus from place to place and he ministered to the sick and he welcomed sinners and he proclaimed good news to people and he stood up against the opposition and ultimately he went to a cross where he suffered and he died so that the light of God could shine into our hearts in time and for all eternity. And now today, we begin that journey again. We get on that road spiritually, if not physically, from the transfiguration of our Lord to the 40 days of Lent, from a sneak preview of Easter Sunday to the price that love paid to bring you and me to the grand finale of life with God forever. Well, in case you were wondering, no, I haven't forgot that today is also Valentine's Day. And it also turns out that I think Valentine's Day actually fits into the story of our journey from transfiguration and into the 40 days of Lent, because one of the possible origins of Valentine's Day takes us back to the third century and to a Christian priest whose name was Valentine. When the Emperor Claudius II uh, decided that 
single men would make much better soldiers in the Roman army than those with wives and families. And besides that, if they happened to be killed in battle, there wouldn't be wives and families left to have to support. And so Claudius II issued a law, a decree preventing those young single men from being married. But Father Valentine had a different vision. And for love and for life, he performed marriages for young lovers in secret until his actions were ultimately discovered and Claudius II had him put to death. The point being, the true love isn't always about a mountaintop experience. It involves willful commitment and service and sacrifice as it did for St. Valentine, as it did for the redeemer of this world, for whom love was a cross. So the light of God's grace and God's truth could shine through the darkness of every person's life and lead us to the grand finale of which this day, this moment, is a preview for us as it was for Peter, James, and John. And so today we celebrate God's presence as we go forward because that grand finale is, is not the end of a pandemic, even though I do have a vision that someday we will meet each other without masks, shoulder to shoulder, singing up a storm, and our ministry will be going together and going forward full blast once again. But what I'm really talking about is God's triumph of light over darkness, of truth over lies, of life over death itself, so that we might know the glory of God in the midst of all of the challenges and whatever the hardships and whatever the obstacles and whatever the questions or burdens or adversities of this life may happen to be, because our vision of our life with God gives us the power to go on through the valley, through all of it, until we experience the grand finale of our life with God forever. And so I encourage you to walk in the light. I encourage you to recapture God's vision of Christ shining in your life. And I invite you to hear the voice of the one who took delight in his son speaking to you today and saying, these are my daughters and sons and I love them and I am giving them a glimpse of the glory that's in store for them until the grand finale comes and it's realized fully in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Together, church, let us join our hearts and minds as we confess our common Christian faith found in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue in worship, we turn our hearts and minds to God as we lift up all our prayers to him. We pray for the church, the world, and for all of creation, trusting in God to hear us as we call. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you revealed your glory in the transfiguration of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who dwells among us in the flesh. Open our eyes of faith that we would see him and continue to dwell among us in all things. Help us to follow your will and to listen to him as he forgives and preserves us through mercy and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, graciously comfort and strengthen those who are sick, hospitalized, or enduring ongoing treatment, that they would know your peace and receive healing and relief according to your good and gracious will. Be with those who are lonely, depressed, or mentally ill. Surround them with those who know your redeeming love and will mercifully care for them. Grant steadfastness to those near death, comfort to those who grieve, and the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to all of your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for all those who have been placed in authority over us, that they would serve with integrity and honor, having the welfare of all in mind, and for our country, that division, conflict, and strife would give way to unity, peace, and quietness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the giver of life and provider of all things in our lives. You've given us the gifts of forgiveness and grace and promised them to us always. We ask that you give us a willing spirit so that we may share your blessing with those in need. Supply resources to enable the church to do your work and support the mission of your church, both near and far. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you created all people in your image. We ask that you, for the astonishing variety of races and cultures in the world, enrich our lives by ever-widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ from us most until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, teach us to listen to Jesus and to fix our eyes on him and his innocent suffering and death for our forgiveness. By your grace and mercy, strengthen us to remain faithful in all circumstances of trial, temptation, and persecution. Preserve us to the end, that even in death, we continue to hold fast to Jesus and the salvation he has prepared for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, into your hands we commend all for who and for what we pray, trusting in you as together we pray the family prayer of the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Receive the Lord's blessing this morning as you depart. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.